everybody and welcome back to the Moshiks mainframe channel. This is Moshiks. Today we start a mini series on the topic of running Linux on the mainframe. And when we say Linux on the mainframe, obviously we don't have a couple of million dollars uh, spare sitting around so we can go and buy a real mainframe and show you how to do it on the real mainframe. And that's why of course we use the Hercules mainframe emulator. And the person that we're doing this mini series with is Matthew Wilson. Matthew Wilson uh, is very well known in the mainframe community. He's the, he has this channel called uh, Mainframes and More with Matthew. Uh, I am a subscriber and, uh, and an avid viewer of, of his videos. I think he is probably the best YouTuber when it comes to mainframes, uh, OpenVMS and OS 400. And I am very lucky that Matthew decided to do this mini series with me. Now, the format that we're going to use for this mini series is different than all other videos I've done in this channel, uh, because we are recording now a an extensive um, a session that's going to last several hours, probably five to six hours in total, and we're going to release it in several parts, probably three parts. But also because I'm recording it from my workstation and. Matthew is going to record it, recording it from his workstation. And so while we're doing uh, the same, I'm going to see the same things uh, through a TMOX session. Of course, his uh, point of view is going to be different than mine and his editing of the videos is going to be very different than mine. So therefore, you, you have the chance to see one version of what we're doing in this mini series from Matthew Wilson's point of view. If you go to his channel, which is uh, this channel here, and I invite you to go visit it and subscribe and then see uh, this mini series from his point of view in his channel. And of course, you can also see the same, pretty much the same uh, mission that we're trying to accomplish from my workstation, from my point of view. And, uh, and there's going to be certain changes, as I said, in editing, as well as uh, how certain things look. I don't know what terminal emulator is using and and I'm using a different terminal emulator. So it's going to be different, but but the same. And it sounds funny, but that's what's going to be. So I, I'm excited about doing this. And uh, again, please do subscribe to um, Matthew Wilson's channel called Mainframe and More with Matthew. And uh, I, I think we'll just get started and get this uh, uh, mission uh, started of installing Linux or Ubuntu on the mainframe in an automated fashion. Hello, Matthew. Hi there, Moshex. How's it going for you? Uh, very well, thanks. How are you? I'm good, thank you. So, um, we're trying today for the first time a, a new uh, format for our both for both our channels and uh, I can I can give a little bit of uh, of a uh, taste what what we're trying to do from my point of view, and then maybe uh, you could say something from your point of view. So we're we're going to do obviously something uh, mainframe related today, and we're going to do it the two of us together, and uh, working on the same computer, working on the same machine, uh, doing something together. And what we're doing today is uh, automating a mainframe uh, Ubuntu installation on top of Hercules and we're going to do it together and see how how this goes and we've never done it together and uh, and see how how it comes out and if people like it and so I'm very excited to be doing this with you I've I'm a huge fan of your videos I've I think I've watched all of your videos both mainframe and OS 400 and uh, open VMS related so uh, I couldn't think of a better person to do this with. Great, well thanks, it's great to be here with you Moshix. And uh, for those of you watching on my channel here, I probably reference Moshix in the majority of my videos in one way or another, particularly the mainframe ones. Uh, so uh, you're probably well familiar with, uh, with Moshix and his work. And yeah, it's great to be here. And I'm curious to see if we're able to get this uh, Z Linux installation all fully automated. Perfect. So uh, our, our mission here today on this video, we'll see how far we get, um, given that uh, an installation of Ubuntu uh, takes quite a long time on a, 
on an emulated mainframe on Hercules. Our mission is to uh, take what we have here in this directory. We have Ubuntu and ISO image. And what we would like to do have create at the end of the day a fully automated installation of Ubuntu from an ISO image so that in the end um, the user would go through the motions and have a fully installed server uh, image, um, emulated disk image that that then starts uh, on the Hercules and then they can log in and they know this is their own particular uh, um, Z Linux image that they can work with. And the background for this is that I had released just a couple of days ago a video where I had made available a fully automated um, uh, Linux image called TKBuntu, which starts with an image that I have provided. And of course, there is a huge security risk for that. Um, people shouldn't just run a network connected uh, operating system image of any kind, not just uh, Z Linux or Linux or Windows. And so the idea came that uh, we should instead start from, from an ISO image and fully automate it so that the end effect is the same, but it's way more secure. Yeah, I think that's a great idea and really important as well. Um, you know, just downloading pre-installed disk images and you know running them on your local computer with access to your local network. Uh, it's certainly good for people to to think twice about that <laughs> and think, wait, why are we doing it this way? So mm -hmm. uh, this sort of uh, auditable, being able to pull from a trusted source and, and do the automated install, uh, I think is a, a great idea and hopefully something that. Uh, you know, it can be leveraged to maybe adapt to other Linux distros. Um, you know, Debian and Ubuntu, certainly their pre-seed automation is, is very similar. Uh, and then we'll, we'll see what else the community can come up with once a automated Linux install is available. Okay. So well, you just said it, it, it takes um, a concept on Ubuntu and Debian uh, uh, denominated machines uh, called pre-seed. So basically you pre-seed the installer with all the answers that it needs to uh, to go through uh, the installation uh, configuration, right? Yeah, and this is how I install really all of my Linux VMs uh, just on my home VMware servers in my lab here. It's really convenient because I can just make a new ISO image of the Debian uh, or the Ubuntu version that I'm interested in. And when I make a new VM, I point the virtual CD-ROM drive to that image uh, and I just fire it up, and a couple minutes later, I'm left with a brand new VM, all up to date, uh, with my preferred exact configuration. So I do have experience doing this with uh, x86. Uh, there will, of course, be a few differences for the S390X mainframe distribution of Linux, so I'll be curious to see how we're able to automate some of those early setup questions. Yes. Um, but otherwise, it looks like it, it works pretty much the same way. And it might even be a little bit easier because we don't need to remaster and remake a new ISO image to boot from. Yes. Um, since the way the mainframe IPLs is uh, quite a bit different than how our regular uh, x86 boxes IPL. OK. Sounds like uh, a fun project. Uh, let's see how far we can get in this session. We don't necessarily have to do it all uh, in today's session. but. Uh, I think we're going to get uh, quite a bit uh, done today. Over, you know. Yeah, I think we're going to have a bit of a learning phase here uh, to begin with. And then once we uh, are able to uh, sort of get through some of the automation steps, we'll be in a better position, I think, to figure out, OK, right, how do we do the fully start to finish uh, kind of one click automation? Yeah, as always in our videos, we go uh, we make these videos and make all the mistakes so that the, the viewer doesn't have to go through the, those mistakes again. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Over to you. You're, you have controls with the keyboard. All right. I have control. So, yeah, let's just dive right in. Um, I'm familiar with the setup that you had started working on for TK Ubuntu. Uh, so it looks like we do have our baseline here, which is a Hercules configuration file that should get us going. Uh, so that looks good. And we'll be set up for a disk image. Uh, we probably won't need the tape, but no harm having that there. And then the network magic is key. So that's good that this is already set up for us. 
Yeah, I think we can remove the terminals actually. Um, they okay. They're yeah. more of a nuisance than anything because they can't be accessed anyway. And then the uh, IP cables automation. So uh, the way this works for people who aren't familiar with uh, one of the approaches that you can take for Hercules networking. Yeah. Uh, let me look at the Hercules configuration file again. Uh, so this is using a CT. CI device that's channel to channel. Uh, do you know what the I stands for? Uh, channel to channel interface. Yeah. Uh, so the way this looks from the Linux perspective is that it creates a, a new network interface on your Linux system that connects one side to this emulated channel to channel interface in the mainframe, and then the other side is. A network interface on the Linux box. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's just these two devices essentially in their own private little network. So the mainframe side will have the IP address 10.1.1.2, uh, even though, of course, inside uh, a, a uh, MVS 3.8 mainframe, there's no concept of IP. This just shows up as a device. But since we're doing Linux, which is a much newer operating system, uh, it will be able to treat this channel-to-channel -channel device that's just plugged in to the host Linux box um, as an actual Ethernet interface that it will be able to assign an IP address to and send packets back and forth. So it's a private network between these two IP addresses, um, the host and Hercules. And then the network setup here sets up the network address translation, the NAT uh, forwarding rules. So by using the Linux box as our router, anything inside of Hercules can talk to this router and it will get natted out to the internet. That's the theory anyway. Yeah, and the rest of the script is just uh, for uh, cosmetics and logging, etc. But I think the part here where it says IP tables, that could be done manually and I and that's exactly what I did for years, um, and and then we just put it into the script. But uh, m you know, many people will probably just be doing this manually, and a lot of the other script uh, uh, lines is just to find out which interface the underlying Linux, uh, which from now on we should just call the host Linux, uh, is that using is, yeah. to get to the internet, so that we we um, we don't automatically get this uh, dollar interface. Um, as, a, as a variable, but uh, it, it, exactly as you said, uh, it's really all it is. It's just a network address translation configuration. Yep, so that's nice and convenient to have it automated. All right, so maybe let's make a folder um, for our first attempt. I'll call it try one. And we'll just copy in uh, everything from that template directory and start customizing it. Uh, so as you suggested, I'm actually going to get rid of the tape drive as well. Yes, we don't think we'll need that. I agree. Yeah, and uh, we'll rename that. We don't need any display terminals. Now, uh, because once Hercules, we... when there is no display uh, terminal uh, configuration in the Hercules configuration file, it will automatically take 3270 as a default port. So um, it still uses one, even if it's not there but it's better to remove it. Okay. And then our DASD here, let's create, um, uh, I know TK Ubuntu used the, the CCKD or emulated a, a CKD device like a 3390. And some of the folks in the mainframe enthusiast discord channel were asking about using the FBA device. Uh, I think it's fixed block addressing. Um, yes because it sounds like that's probably a faster disk emulation, uh, I don't know, particularly for Linux or just overall in Hercules. So I think we can probably give that a try. Yeah, it is. Yeah, FBA is essentially an iSCSI device, uh, sorry, a SCSI device. And it is, it is quite a bit faster uh, for Hercules to emulate than a CKD. All right, so it looks like our FBA devices uh, may as well just go with the newest uh, type of device here, 9336. Yep. And uh, how big do we want our uh, root volume to be here? I think, you know, I'm thinking maybe four gigabytes 
Um, it's really all that's needed for Linux install 5. I've installed it on as little as 2 gigabytes. All right, yeah, we'll give ourselves a little breathing room then with yeah. uh, maybe 4 gigabytes. So yeah. we're going to need to give it 512 byte sectors so we can do the math here. Oh, do we not have uh, the desktop calculator? Well, uh, <laughs> I saw that. Um, yeah, I haven't oh, set right, the yeah, password. In the password. Yeah. There we go. Okay. Now, the host Linux here is just an Ubuntu itself. I think it is actually Ubuntu 18.04. Ah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah, in the end, anything that can run Hercules, and we're using a recent build of the SDL Hyperion Hercules here, um, should be able to do this yep. same thing. Uh, so if you want four gigabytes, which is four times that many 1024s, <laughs> that looks about right. And then yes. we have 512 byte sectors. So that's yep. going to be that many sectors. Yep. So we can do DASD init 64. Uh, this is going to be, do you want to use compressed or just uncompressed? Uncompressed, I think it's a bit faster. Okay. Uh, and we can do LFS to make it one file. And this is going to be a 9336 FBA device. I'll just call it uh, maybe HD0. Yep. And it will be 83886. 608. Uh, what am I missing here? Do I need to see HD0? Does the volume label go last? I've already forgotten. Uh, Something like that. Yeah, I think the volume label goes last. Yeah. Uh, oh, sorry. That's. Or does the, the file name goes first? There we go. HD0. Uh, uh, vol serial number goes first, and then size goes last. Oh, okay. Eventually. Okay, perfect. So one, while it's doing this, um, actually the latest Hyperion images from Fish on the GitHub, they've changed again the syntax inside the, the Hercules configuration file. And, uh, and uh, we'll see if, it, it just happened very recently, we'll see when we start this Hercules if it's complaining about it or not, I, I wonder. but. Uh, but they've changed the uh, the uh, Z arch configuration um, uh, quite a bit. So we see here arch architect oh, arch level. Mode. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this should become now facility um, bit. But uh, let's see if it still accepts it right now, it's even in old style. But let's see what comes out. All right. Uh, so we changed the device type to that 9336 FBA, and then our file. Yep. Uh, device 120 is fine. So that should do it for our Hercules. And we're giving four gigabytes of memory and four CPUs, which is plain enough. Um, it doesn't actually accelerate that much if you give it four CPUs or eight or 16, even for people who have uh, giant uh, personal computers, because at some point uh, it's, it's one of those uh, diminishing returns uh, uh, situations for, for Hercules. Yeah, I think between the emulation overhead uh, and then, of course, something like installing Linux is just a single-threaded process exactly. anyway. So yeah, yeah. Uh, that's good. All right, so the last thing we need to do in order to uh, install from an Ubuntu ISO is actually copy the contents of the ISO uh, out so that we'll be able to modify them. And uh, also, you don't point Hercules at an ISO image, you point it at some files inside the ISO image. Yeah. So we'll go ahead and mount that. Loop read only, and we can just throw it on slash mount. So if we look at that, that is the contents of our uh, install image. So let's put that somewhere convenient. Uh, we'll make a directory called maybe Ubuntu you know, or install. Yeah. And then we just want a uh, sort of exact copy of our CD content there. So I'll put that into our Ubuntu folder with our sync. OK. And we verify that the files were expected. Yep. So we're done with the image. We can unmount that. 
and of course we already see the pre-seed directory here um, so it is it is one of the facilities of any Ubuntu or Debian to be able to pre-seed the installer so yeah so it looks like it's giving you some examples for either a minimal or a regular install so that uh, could help us out as a starting point uh, but we'll take a look at that in uh, sort of our next phase here uh, the other interesting thing about the the mainframe IPL process here when we're we're booting from what were essentially an emulated CD-ROM drive or DVD drive uh, is that what you IPL from is this .ins file and as far as I can tell what this does is it tells the mainframe to put the contents of these files on the CD or out of this directory at these locations in memory. Yes, exactly. Uh, and then I think it just starts up from right, so the normal IPL address as if these were cards, starting with the first card at address zero here, and then it does all of its IPL work. Exactly. So we have two facilities that might help us with preceding later, which is the PARM file. Uh, and when you boot Linux on an x86 machine, whether you're using Grub or direct UFI booting, um, you're able to pass parameters to the kernel on the kernel command line using your bootloader. Uh, well, there is not really the equivalent of a bootloader on the mainframe, but this PARM file contains what will eventually be passed to the kernel as the kernel command line arguments. Yeah. Uh, so the Linux kernel for uh, the mainframe just knows to look at apparently this particular address for those parameters. Yeah. Uh, and then, of course, the init RD, which I suspect is where we will end up um, needing to put our pre-seed file. Uh, that's interesting because we might then need to tell it what the size of that init RD is. I've, I've never actually modified an init RD on the mainframe, so we'll see what that process looks like. All right, let's see. Okay, so I think in a, I don't think we got all of our network interfaces. Yeah, yeah, we need to set up network interface and maybe we could also do some logging for later. Okay, um, so for the network interface, if you make the, let's see, actually, where is our, her IFC? Uh, so if you set the sticky bit, yes, uh, or the set UID bit on the, a uh, little Hercules utility program called Herc IFC. Then you don't need that to. That will allow it to run as root. Um, so you don't need to run all of Hercules as root. It will actually just call this interface setup program to do the stuff it needs to do to create the uh, yep. the tap the ton tap network interfaces. Yep. Uh, also, while we're here, we can run that set network script. Yeah, it wants the logs directory, but uh, it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but it looks like it did what it needed to do. So we should have network access from inside of Hercules uh, through those IP tables. Let's see. Rules. Let's do uh, a, uh, an IPA for the uh, ton zero interface to make sure it's there. Uh, ton zero. I mean, not until Hercules starts. Let's try that. Okay, yeah, so that worked that time. Oh, and uh, you suggested, so if we do Hercules, if we log everything um, to a file, just key that yep. uh, to a try a one dot log. Okay, we're not gonna get the nice graphical Hercules uh, capabilities here because it's going to a file now instead of our yes. highly capable console, but that's okay. Uh, so let's make a new session here. So now if I IPA ton zero, what? is it tap zero? Uh, one, maybe ton one. Uh, ton one. <laughs> let's just do an if con. Oh, it's, uh, you need a, um, it's like dash. Yeah, dash. Uh, I in a fray, where is it? Uh, Let's see, it's going to be a different man page IP address. IP address dev. Okay, dev, so IPA yeah. dev ton uh, zero. Ton uh, uh, one. Ton <laughs> one, one. Let's just do a. Oh, yeah, that works. 
Okay, here it is. Ah, okay. okay. Yeah, so it did uh, indeed start up a tunnel. So the yep. difference between ton zero and ton, uh, tap and ton, of course, uh, ton zero is level three and tap is going to be level two. Um, so this, of course, correctly started this as a tunnel. So that's that's uh, that's ten dot one dot one dot one. And of course, this is the host operating system we're on. And then uh, Linux, once it starts inside Hercules, will have the address dot two here at the end. Ten dot one dot one dot two. Excellent. Okay, so in Hercules here. Uh, before we try any fancy automation or anything, we'll just make sure that we can IPL the installer uh, and establish network connectivity. And we do that by saying IPL, and it was Ubuntu 1804 installer installer. <laughs> I think install. Install, yes. Yeah. Ubuntu.ins. That should start the process of loading that. Uh, install kernel I'm thinking that maybe it's easier to just have the normal Hercules panel so we have we see also that's the what I'm thinking as well yeah, yeah. <laughs> let me uh, let's just quit this and, and try that again <laughs> all right so yeah let's just do normal Hercules here and again INS. Okay, so we see. Okay, now we can actually see it working here with the MIPS number and the instruction yeah. counter. And what it's doing here is uh, reading in that Ubuntu kernel into memory. So you can see here 64 MIPS in the lower right corner here. Yep. Okay. Okay, so now you might recognize these are the actual Linux kernel boot messages. Of course, it needs to uh, decompress and unpack the the RAM image, so that takes uh, some some work for the processor. That's why we have such a high MIPS rate at the beginning. And we see here uh, something called uh, channel to channel driver. Uh, initialized and loading uh, the LCS driver, which is the networking driver for uh, for the mainframe. All right. Yeah. All right. And uh, here we are. So, why don't you configure our network device? So, uh, Linux for the mainframe, uh, or at least the Debian-based distributions, require installing uh, over the network. So, the first thing it wants to do is set up the network. So we have our CTC device, and we will tell it the first device address is the read device, and the second device address is the write device. Which is what we have in the Hercules configuration file. If you remember, we have two devices, channel-to-channel uh, -channel devices, effectively one for reading or obtaining traffic and one for sending traffic, and that's exactly what we're giving it. Yeah, uh, and I'm not sure how these protocol selections affect the interface, but since we're using Linux, I'm going to try the Linux option here. All right, we don't want to use DHCP uh, because we have to hard code the addresses of both sides of the tunnel in Hercules, and we'll just go ahead and set static IP addresses here in Linux. So that's going to be 10.1.1.2 uh, for our Linux, our mainframe Linux side of things. That's uh, we'll just do a slash 24 there. And then 10.1.1.1 is the host Linux, which will be our gateway, our network router. Exactly. So Zilinux thinks that the tunnel interface we just saw on the host Linux is a router, but in, of course, as we know, it's just uh, a tunneling device. Yeah. Uh, and you'll notice that I'm typing a period, a dot, before every input. Uh, that's because, remember, we are still on the Hercules console here. 
Uh, so if I just type a command at this Hercules prompt, Hercules would think I'm trying to run a Hercules command, like attach a new device or IPL the system. Uh, but by typing a dot, that's the default character for Hercules to pass whatever I enter through to the operating system's uh, console, which in this case is our, our Linux guests console. Uh, so we're just using the Cloudflare 1.1.1. Dot one DNS server. And there's actually some thinking into that. Um, the Google DNS 8.8.8 .8 .8 does not accept uh, large format DNS queries, which for instance, ZOS or ZVM uh, send out, uh, whereas, whereas the Cloudflare DNS server 1.1.1 .1 does accept those. So um, some folks have, you know, have tried to configure um, ZOS or ZVM to use uh, the, D the Google DNS. They, they think DNS doesn't work, but it's just because Google doesn't handle all the uh, RFC formats. Uh, that's interesting. Um, uh, when we're waiting for the installer to, to do something, we have a second where we just need to sit and wait. I have a, another large DNS uh, story. <laughs> uh, so. Uh, basically, what this installer is saying now is we're not actually going to do the installation from the the console device here. Uh, it configured the network such that from any other system, we then SSH into this system, and then we'll get the normal uh, sort of uh, graphical text user interface, uh, Debian and Ubuntu installer. So it's saying since you're going to SSH in, you need to set a temporary password just for the session. So I'll just use the password test. And now it's telling me that I should be able to SSH into the system. So remember, this 10.1.1.2 IP address is the IP address of our Z Linux guest uh, operating system running here in Hercules. So we'll switch over to the next uh, TMX session down here. And we should be able to SSH into installer at 10.1.1.2. Okay, that's a good sign. We'll accept that host fingerprint. Uh, that password we set up as test. All right. And here we are. We're in the installer. Uh, so I think since we're just experimenting with this, the first thing we can do is just make sure the network works. Um, uh, obviously, it's working to some degree locally, but can we get out to the internet at large? So we'll just go into a shell here and start pinging things. Yeah, that's working. So from inside our Linux running inside of Hercules, we're able to get out to the internet through those IP tables, network address translation rules that that set network script set up. Uh, we can also try pinging things by name to make sure that name resolution works. Yep. Yeah, perfect. That looks good. I exit out of this and then reconnect. We'll be back at that initial installer prompt. And so some people have been asking me, um, why can I not um, connect with the uh, host Linux and uh, you know, or other machines on my home network from within Z Linux? And uh, obviously, it doesn't know anything about your uh, let's say one dot you know one ninety two one uh, dot one sixty eight dot zero dot something network because it, all it can see is the tunneling device ten dot one dot one dot one and from there straight to the internet it doesn't it's not able to access any of the other devices you would have to set some other special networking tricks to do that yeah and so that's what I end up typically doing in some other uh, uh, operating systems that run inside of emulators. Uh, like I got the, the IBM Z develop and test uh, personal edition from IBM, which uses their mainframe emulator. And it's very similar network setup to uh, what you would see in Hercules here. And one of the options is just one of these private tunnel devices between the host Linux and whatever's running inside of the emulator. And I actually set up on my router at home uh, the routing table to know that those uh, the IP address of 
the emulated system inside of the mainframe emulator can be routed to through my host Linux. And so it's actually uh, routing it as if it was going through another network router to get back to that IP address. And that's one of the ways that uh, if you want to set it up that way, yeah. uh, you're able to expose that to other systems on your network. But it, it does require changing the route tables on either your machines that you're trying to access it with or network wide if you're able to set that up in your uh, in your network router yeah and, and one more a way to do that maybe we could explore this in a future video together if, if uh, people end up uh, approving of this format is to use the a bridge uh, device um, a virtual bridge device on Linux on the host Linux uh, which makes a few things much easier when it comes to uh, level three um, networking. Um, but we can explore this in a future video. Definitely. Yeah, that's how I do all of my SimH networking. So for my VMS uh, on the SimH Vax simulator, mm -hmm. uh, it is able to just attach the network interface to a TAP device. And if I put that in a bridge, it's just sitting there on my network as a real uh, really is a real layer two device. So if you then give it an IP address that's in your local network's IP space, yeah. uh, everything else on your network has has direct access to it. So that's a great way to set these up as well. I was playing with trying to do something like that with Hercules um, using, I think they're the LCS network devices. Yeah. And it, uh, back at least in the, the Hercules uh, 3.x, Days. I don't think that was really fully implemented. And the last time I tried it in the uh, Hyperion days, I, I found it to be pretty buggy. But I haven't tried it with the SDL Hyperion. Um, so it has been quite a while. I, I suspect it's uh, a bit more stable and, and more fully implemented now. So yeah, now it's know. called a Q... Um, oh, QE. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's a QETH or QEthernet device. Yeah. And for level three, it's fully functional. But level two is uh, lacking almost all of the functions. And so it can be a mixed bag experience. Uh, if people know exactly what they're doing, I think it works. But um, but uh, it, it's it's still a work in progress when it comes to full Ethernet emulation. And of course, okay, you, yeah. you can understand how complex a topic that is. <laughs> oh, yeah, it's a, uh, it, it's a whole video series unto itself. Yeah. So this seems to be running. Yeah, so this is working. Um, so it's retrieving all of this over the network. So our network connectivity is working. Uh, in fact, if we go back and look at Hercules, uh, we're up to, looks like it was exceeding 75 MIPS there. So it is doing a lot of work. Uh, and I believe this yellow highlight here means that Hercules is currently um, using that device, or the guest operating system is currently yes. using that device, and you can see the numbers here occasionally increasing. So, yeah. uh, sure enough, it's it's working. It's sitting here. It's reading all this data over the network, and it will continue with the installation. So, I I think uh, Moshex, you already have basically just a basic installed uh, DASD image after this whole process is done. Yes. So I have one fully installed from this very same uh, ISO image, uh, Ubuntu server installed, done. Obviously, um, just for for the purpose of being complete here, it doesn't make much sense um, to have an, a, a Linux with desktop capability installed on <laughs> yes. the server because there is no video card rendering anything. So um, obviously, it's all just server. But yeah, I have an image of already installed. And, and I think you're asking because after the installation uh, of an Ubuntu um, server or any Ubuntu image, there's going to be a file written somewhere, and uh, I don't remember where, with all the choices you gave it during the during the installation process. So you could take that and make that feed that into the next installer, right? Uh, essentially, yes. And so. Um you know, you can find a lot of examples of pre-seed files. Uh, we saw, you know, Ubuntu gives you some on the installation CD, but of course, if you look online in the documentation, there are a lot of examples. But none of the examples were particularly tailored for the mainframe yeah. uh, version of the installer. And for the most part, it will all be the same. 
Uh, in fact, everything sort of from this point forward will be the same as any other Ubuntu installation. But those initial questions that were asked back here um, through the Hercules console, uh, you know, particularly like what's the right device for the CTC interface and what's the read device for the CTC interface, uh, that of course is, is very mainframe specific for these channel to channel interfaces. And I've never seen a sample pre seed file that uh, has that at all. So my hope is that that was captured as part of the installation log and we'll be able to take a look on an installed Ubuntu copy uh, for the mainframe and see if there's anything in that installation log that the pre-seed or the, the deb comp, the Debian configuration system is what this is all based on. Um, that looks like it was the answers to those questions. And then so if we add those into a pre-seed file that should otherwise work on any platform uh, when you're installing Ubuntu, uh, I'm hoping that it answers some of these initial questions for us automatically as well. I'm really curious to find out if it captures those because it's and me too. It, it's in a funny state at that moment. It's not a real operating system quite yet. It's just a kernel, but um, let let's see if it captures those initial. Yeah, and I think it'll depend on if this process is done through the Debian installation system or if this is actually something special that's running ahead of time for the mainframe. Exactly. Uh, now, if it's not pre-seedable, if it's not part of the regular installation program, uh, we do have a fallback, right? Hercules has an automation capability and it could read and wait for certain prompts and reply using Hercules functionality at this stage. Uh, so that that could be our other option if we're not able to make this automated 100% with the typical uh, Ubuntu pre-seed mechanism. Yep, we'll find out. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and stop this. And if you are interested in what a full manual Linux installation on the mainframe looks like, um, I believe you have a video on just that uh, on the Moshix mainframe channel. Yes, and I will uh, link to it in the description below this video you're watching right now to that video that just goes th through exactly what we're doing right now, uh, exactly the same thing. It's It can be, it depends on how fast a machine is. It, this could actually take two hours. So it's, uh, it's not um, a very fast process because every instruction needs to be emulated by Hercules. Um, I just uh, finished a recompiling GCC on Linux on inside Hercules and uh, because we have this instruction counter we just saw now a few seconds ago I saw that it takes 35 trillion instructions for <laughs> uh, for a compilation of GCC and uh, and I quickly calculated that and 35 trillion instruction if you were executing one instruction every second which is you know, a human comprehensible time horizons, it would equate to about one million years. So oh, there wow. is, yeah. it's quite substantial the amount of work that Hercules has to do here. And the fact that it's doing it reliably and it finishes it is kind of a testament to how well engineered uh, uh, Hercules really is. It is impressive. Uh, I mean, it's all, it's just mind boggling to think about how many instructions every modern computer is executing, <laughs> right? Just yep. the amount of work they're able to do so quickly yep. uh, is, is really, really amazing. Uh, all right, so is this, uh, is this TK Ubuntu that we want to use to have that installed image? Uh, yes, this should, okay. if you execute yeah. that with sudo, uh, it should just automatically launch it. All right. Uh, oh yeah, and enter that I again. forgot to, sorry about that. No worries. So this tells us that it gives us five cores and four gigabytes of memory. And as you can see, this is the fully automated uh, image that I was re talking about that I had actually made a video about last week. And so it just, it just does everything automatically. And this is, of course, a already installed image of Ubuntu. This is, has yeah. already been installed. Where this is not the installer. It's not going to run the installer at all. Right. And again, our goal is to look at an installed image and see if uh, we see anything interesting 
in its installation log that will tell us what the pre-seed parameters are for those, those very first steps. And so here's... We'll wait a minute for that to come up. Uh, so you were talking about DNS. Uh, it's kind of funny, for a while, uh, actually most of my career I worked in uh, companies that made healthcare IT software. Okay. And one of the sort of emerging trends in healthcare was uh, secure encrypted messaging, right, between healthcare providers, mm -hmm. healthcare organizations, all of those things. Of course. Uh, and a, a standard that came out uh, that was uh, sort of sponsored by the U.S. federal government in collaboration with some of the big healthcare standards organizations uh, was called Direct, and it, it was built on S-MIME, so email with X509 certificates. Yes. And the big problem, of course, with S-MIME and X509 in general is, well, how do I get a certificate that I know I can trust for the recipient? And they decided to use the DNS system for that. Um, so there is oh. a little used DNS record type called CERT, C-E-R-T. Yes. That you can shove an entire X509 certificate, certificate chain in, all that kind of stuff. But of course, that well exceeds the uh, you know single UDP packet that you would be able to send in a typical DNS query. <laughs> uh, so on top of most DNS providers don't support the cert record type, um, you'd either have to be running your own you know bind server or using one of the few providers that did. Uh, you also had to have your entire DNS chain between the client and you know whatever the target organization is that is serving up these cert records if you're looking up somebody's uh you know domain uh, it had to support tcp dns queries uh you know and the automatic fallback to tcp queries when you get the flag that it's too big so it's all in the dns specs like any yep. uh any compliant dns implementation will work with it but like you said right a lot of them uh, either for abuse prevention or, you know, denial of service attack, expensive query, you know, prevention. Um, they just turn it off, figuring that nobody's actually using this stuff. But, you know, you have to assume that software on the Internet expects the RFCs to be implemented correctly <laughs> if you can be a, a yeah. compliant. Uh, but for mainframe, Cloudflare's 1.1.1.1 is the best address to go to. It works well. That's good to know. Uh, all right, so, so we should be able to log in now. Is that all up and running? All right, let's go yep. over to one again. And I'll take control here. Okay, go ahead and yeah, connect us up to that. Because I know system. the user. <laughs> you know the password you said. Yes. <laughs> so we're now SSHing into the Zilinux image that's running uh, on the, uh, that's running here. So. And they will complain now, yeah. So uh, yes, uh, uh, because we already we just connected to the previous installing the Linux. Um, we need to remove this uh, this entry uh, because it's already in, in in my it was already in my uh, known host file in my SSH configuration. Right. So we'll go in again. Oh. Uh, and password for this image is, but I think I, t I just typed it wrong. Okay, TK Ubuntu. There we go. Alrighty, and uh, the. Alrighty, so, so we're logged in. Here. We're looking... yeah. Go ahead. Well, I just got some echo on my side. Okay, <laughs> try that again. Uh, so the file we're looking for is logged in the installer's log directory, and we're hoping to see... Oh, so it's actually a directory, the cdeb conf directory. Interesting. So I'm not sure if these are... Uh, ah, they're private, and it's just tk... Ubuntu. Huh. Interesting. So yeah, I think for every package, yes, all sorts of stuff here. Yeah. Uh, so there is a utility called. Uh, let's see here. I think it's devconf 
get selections. Yeah, it's been Hang years up. since I've installed. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, I've uh, I've looked in the it's Appendix B in the Debian installation manual. Okay. Um, it's in oh I see. So we might need to install it. It's in the Deb Conf Utils package. And we'll find out if networking is working See, fine. The networking still works. Yeah. yeah. It should be. You may need an update first, but no. There it goes. Okay. Of course, yeah, it relates to the um to the uh, Ubuntu package manager here. And it goes to us.ports.ubuntu.com slash ubuntu dash ports yeah and already we can see um, uh, you know uh, obviously running the Linux on Hercules is not going to be a blazing fast performance even on a very fast AMD Ryzen machine or anything like that it's just every instruction that Hercules needs to execute for the mainframe architecture results in anything between 50 and 100 um, Intel instructions on the processor, on the underlying Intel processor or AMD processor to execute. So it's going to be a factor 50 to 100 times slower, at least. Yeah, and it's it's pure software emulation or simulation of the mainframe, right? It's not like running an x86 VM on an x86 box using the hardware VM assists or anything like that. So, I, I, I mean, again, it's, it's pretty amazing that you can even get anything done at all. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, it, it seems like it should be a lot slower than it even actually is. So, yeah. uh, impressive, impressive tools we have here today. Um, so let's say, let's just call this preseed.installer. Uh, see what we get in this file. So yeah, I mean, sometimes um, the, the notions of emulation and virtualization get confused. Virtualization mm -hmm. is using the underlying uh, processor and basically runs almost at full processor speed when you have virtualization such as with uh, KVM or Zen or ESX, whereas uh, what we're doing here is emulation. So uh, the underlying processor does not understand mainframe instructions and those need to be emulated in hardware. In software, sorry. Yeah, yeah. All right. Well, this isn't something I expected to take a long time, but <laughs> yeah. Let's see, uh, oh yeah, it is thinking. So it must yeah. be doing quite a bit of parsing of that. Yeah. Um, of that installer log. And I wonder what uh, what it says at the very beginning. We'll find that very soon, if it is already seeing those answers we put yeah, in, in the console. Yeah, I'm not sure console. if they'll end up being in order or if, uh, <laughs> if yeah. it's alphabetical or, or what. But yeah, I'm, I'm curious to see what this file looks like. So depconf uh, get selections. Yeah, and it sounds already from the name like it's just uh, taking the the package selections for the um, installation, in, in, installation uh, configuration. So... I don't expect it to know anything about the console input at the beginning. Yeah, unless that's part of the installer. Yeah, we'll see. And speaking about DNS, you were just talking about it. Uh, at the very beginning, the when DNS was created or bind was created, it was meant to be a distributed database architecture. So BIND or the DNS server side can do a lot more than just uh, serving um, IP addresses. It, it's mm -hmm. really quite an amazing architecture. And it has been extended also recently. Yeah, no, new, new record types do sort of pop up from time to time through new RFCs. Yeah. And uh, there we go. Um, a lot of you know DNSSEC is also a a public private key um, sort of based encryption key distribution system uh, that uses some of its own record types. That's probably one of the newer, yep. uh, most widely used extensions. 
right, what does this look like? Okay, so I do recognize this format as the the precede yeah. uh, sort of format. How many lines do we have here? Oh, okay, only 1,200, almost 1,300 lines. But it, I saw uh, an error at the very end there. Did you see it? Failed to process the pre-configuration file. Uh, well, so DI, that's an actual directive. Um, oh, okay, yeah. So yeah. basically, what the documentation said about this tool is that it don't use this pre-seed file it generates because it spits out basically every internal parameter of every package. Um, yeah. Many of which, you know, shouldn't be part of pre-seed. So I think there's a specific, uh, uh, I guess, Z fiber channel driver. Yeah. Um, we could so, search for CTC and see if there's anything particular yeah, to that. Yeah, uh, let's look for CTC. See. Yeah. Okay, so do you accept this configuration? True, that's good. There it is. Aha, choose right, so there it is. CTC write device, and there's probably a CTC read device somewhere. Uh, ah, choices, okay, so this is where we selected yeah. network type. Okay, yeah, so all of those preliminary questions, that is the Debian installer running. Um, to set up then the remote access to it. So that's that's promising. Now, um, there's also an interesting part to this pre-seed is, which is how the password is being handled because they obviously need to provide the user and the password and that is, um, there's some security around that, right? There's, there's an encryption for the password. Yeah, so there's two ways you could do it. Um, it accepts as if you were inputting your password in plain text in the installer boxes that ask you what do you want your root password to be um, and you you know there are pre-seed items for password and then password confirm because it, it makes you type it twice yes um, the other option is you can give it the pre-encrypted password as it appears in the shadow file yeah yeah so uh, you know basically from this this dollar sign, dollar six through the uh, the next colon here, the slash here. Uh, if you put this in the pre-seed file, yeah. it will just pass this this password verbatim through to the shadow file here. Yeah. So, why don't we? You know, we, we have a couple of options here. If we think down the road in terms of okay, what is a user going to do to? run this automation to install their own Z Linux. Um, you know, the, the, the script they run to do that could prompt them for what they want their password to be. Yes, and then uh, salt and it. And then embed that in the pre-seed file. Yep. In which case we would either embed it as plain text, <laughs> um, or it's actually surprisingly difficult to generate these. Yes. Uh, from a shell from like there's a utility in I think the who is package of all things yep. <laughs> that might let you do it um, but that, that'll be something we can look into and, and again that gets more not necessarily to what we need to figure out today to make pre-seed work but the shell script that wraps this all up uh, what, what will be the best way for us to let the user pick a password uh, the alternative of course is for us to just embed a set password that's in the readme and then the first thing they should do once they log into their new system is change their password but I, I think it'd be more ideal if we can let them set a password from the start yes uh, there is some issues obviously because the generated encrypted password may contain some sequences that um, bash or i don't know which uh, interpreter we're going to use may have an issue with um, I, I, uh, I'm speaking of exp from experience, yeah, unfortunately. Yeah. yeah. Okay, so I'm going to start copying these lines that seem relevant here. So, let's see if I can do this. Um, let's make a new. Let's call BC. I'll call the CTC precede notes. Yep. This one is definitely critical. Yeah, absolutely. And oops, 
uh, see it's just screen still, I always hit control A and then the number. <laughs> And okay, yeah, so I, this was the very first question, right? Select the network type. And the mode, so yeah, it appears this Linux mode uh, was working for us. Yes, so second option. Yeah. That's good. And I'm guessing this isn't a value we actually precede, but let me just grab it so that we yeah. have it. And there's our read device. Very good. We'll just have to make sure to use the same device names for the final Hercules yep. config. <laughs> But we can just copy it from the one we're running right now. Yeah, well, I think the template uh, that we used on the other system had the same, the same device address. Yes, so, exactly yeah, the same. Just, that'll yeah. be that'll be part of the template that is used for all of this. Yeah. Okay, I think that was it. Yeah. Uh, um, did I did I grab that one just in case? Now, again, guessing. I see uh, this is not one we need to precede, but just in case, let's grab it. Yeah. Okay. Uh, do you think there's anything else that might be mainframe specific that we'd look for? Well, yeah, there is something here, which is uh, this is a CKD. Um, disk install and right. um, I, you know if we go with FBA I don't know if those are exactly the same uh, don't remember uh, off the top of my head but but uh, this uh, is certainly a CKD install yeah so what I'm hoping and I think from the precedes I've done before um, there's a mode for the disks where you essentially just tell it Whatever the first disk you find, just use the whole disk and partition it the way you want automatically. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, so I'm hoping that isn't tied to a particular device address or device type. Um, yeah. I, hopefully it'll just do the right thing and magically work. Okay. So uh, we'll leave that running in case we need to reference anything. But maybe now we can take a look at one of these samples. So let's uh, look at Ubuntu. Let's copy server to, let's try one here. Yep. OK. Uh, some device LVM. I don't know what that is. And inside our installed image, I don't know that we really want to use LVM. I think we could just use regular. Yeah, I think in a second step, I think people will want to have LVM just so if you want to, um, it makes it much easier to expand the, the DASTY or add the second one and make it all look like one logical uh, volume. Maybe I just I wonder about the overhead in the emulated environment. Ah, uh, yeah. Um, yeah. I, you know, I think one one approach is, uh, you know, maybe just if people do want to expand the space, uh, we can have easy instructions to attach a second device, and then set it up as your home directory or something like that. Yeah. Um, but if they want to install more packages and expand the root device, oh well. Uh, oh, so actually. Um, because we're not distributing the finished DASD, right? That can just be a parameter to the script to set it up. Yes. Of exactly. how big they want that DASD init step to run. And yeah. then people can choose whatever size they want. And You're right about that. Yes. Yeah, we, we don't really need to worry about distribution size like with the, the pre-made TK Ubuntu. So, yeah. okay, that's good. I'm not too worried about that then. Um, okay. 
So I think the options we have, um, yeah, just string. Uh, sorry, off to the side, I'm looking at a preset I've done before. It does ask for a device address, like dev SDA, I have hard coded into my preset okay. file. Yep. So we may need to know where the devices are. Um, oh, sorry, this, let's see, we should be back in. And for here. SCSI, is it SDA? Um, do you remember? Yeah, so that's what I don't know. I don't know if it'll be DASDA still or if FDAs will show up as a different device type. Yeah, we can actually find out. We can test that pretty quickly if we just shut, or actually we can just attach maybe live and it may show up. Yeah, if we do an LS, uh, yep. Yeah, so let me, um, for the yeah. current one's at 120, if we say, what is it, attach? Yep. The 121. Uh, first, the device, 9336. Oh, I thought the address comes first. Oh, uh, yeah, you're right. Yeah, the address. Yeah, you're right. Okay, so 121 and then 9336. And we have our, I'll just attach our try one. Since it's there. Since yeah. Since it's there. Yeah. Um, okay. So I wonder if Linux fix that up dynamically. Let's look at. So there is yeah. some mainframe specific commands, which um, uh, let me, my control, so let okay. me see. Uh, see. Uh, where, what's the command again? I always forget those because you don't really. <laughs> I would say probably not a command we've ever seen on yeah. uh, any other platform for sure. Um, if nothing else, we can just reboot it and hopefully it would pick it up at, at boot. Um, something like that. Uh, yeah. It's this command here, chz dev, and uh, there's also ch. Uh, or I don't. I don't really remember them. <laughs> um, Lee ls block LS. obviously doesn't yeah, see LS. that. LS. Um, or is that LS DASD? Yeah, sorry. <laughs> sorry, I'm typing over here. Your controls. Yeah, it's just the one it knows about. So I am going to uh, just reboot here. <laughs> yeah. That will probably be faster than yep. me trying to figure out how those commands work. <laughs> Let's see if that, uh, if, yeah, if I hit escape here. Okay, yeah, we do have the device attached. So yeah, 121. Uh, starting reboot. One, uh, my controls. So one of the things okay. um, is that people sometimes wonder why is 121 at the bottom, not below this 120, because this will be the next device address. And uh, one thing to remember is in this panel, which obviously emulates an S370 uh, real hardware panel, uh, it lists the devices in the order it finds it in the Hercules configuration file. It doesn't sort them by device address. What was very important to understand. So sometimes people have a lot of devices here and there's one device they want to see and then want to see 40 or 50 3270 terminals in their Hercules panel here, then just put them at the top of your Hercules configuration file. And uh, yeah, we'll I always put top. my you know, massive list of terminals down at the bottom, so, so they're not getting in the way of the more <laughs> yes. devices on this panel. Yeah. So uh, okay. let's see where we are. Uh, starting reboot. So does it actually reboot? Yeah, it's, it's doing work. OK. Well. Yeah, uh, I doubt it will actually really as reboot. They may not yeah. actually reboot, yeah. Um, I don't think that Hercules is. It works on the real uh, IR on the real mainframe. Yeah. It had they had to add some capabilities to make the mainframe reboot uh, Linux, but it doesn't uh, work with Hercules. So we will have to just start it again. I found it's going to completely start Hercules again. Even interestingly, also ZOS itself and MVS doesn't have a reboot. Uh, feature, <laughs> right. uh, whereas ZVM does have uh, a reboot feature. Oh, interesting. I didn't know that. Uh, do you want to go ahead and enter the oh, sorry, yeah. host uh, CD password, please? Thank you. 
Okay, uh, no. Nope. Okay. I don't want to forget to attach that FBA yep. device again. So, oh, oh, right. I don't. No, stop. <laughs> yeah, we have to put it in the configuration file, I guess. Up all. There we go. Yeah. Uh, yeah, maybe that'll be safer. Okay. Nine three three six at try one i one eight yeah. zero dot fba and so again for we're doing this to find out if the uh, SCSI devices or fba devices are enumed the same way in the operating system so right because yeah in our pre seed we need to know what device uh, name under Linux we want to format and install on. So it'll either be DASD zero or something else zero for yep. FBA devices. <laughs> and of course, uh, for folks who are watching this video, if they were expecting a fast uh, <laughs> you know, answer to the question, how do I automate it? Uh, there is no fast answer that we, it's quite a tedious process to find out all these edge cases so that we can have a as as deterministic a, as possible a process to have uh, Ubuntu installed. Right, and like I said, we go through this so the viewers don't have to. Right, we want to be able to say the answer to well, how do I automate it? Is you look at the end result of our work here to figure this all out. <laughs> but yeah. Obviously, a lot of people are interested, and in, well, you know, how do you know that? How do you go about finding it out? And right, this is what we do. It's just kind of through experimentation and. Uh, see what things look like and it's it's an iterative process to get there we're not just born with this knowledge <laughs> for sure yep and by the way i don't know if you uh know that um but the kind of sentence i'm doing i'm going through this so you don't have to is it was a standard sentence by jerry purnell at byte magazine uh, he used to write this in his articles all the time and sadly passed away about five years ago he was a friend of mine Uh, Jerry Purnell was hugely popular during the 80s and 90s when Byte Magazine was at its peak. Really at its peak, yeah. There's definitely a culture of, uh, you know, people who were into computers uh, were much more into computers, <laughs> right? You had a computer because computers were kind of your hobby. Yeah. Uh, whereas, you know, now they're, of course, you know, everybody has computers, Um uh, and they're much more accessible, and you know they're they're just tools for a lot of people, and, and not just the hobby. But yeah, I, I think back to sort of the peak of Byte Magazine when, you know, uh, so many people were into just the internals and how everything worked, and oh, yeah. uh, it yeah. was it was much more of a, an exclusive club uh, that uh, that you were sort of either in or not. <laughs> yep. There's the there's the first rule of or first law of computing by Jerry Purnell at Byte Magazine was when something doesn't work, always check the cables first. And I, I yes. stick to it to this day, and it's it's just true. I mean... <laughs> it's not, yeah, just reseat that cable, maybe it came loose a little. Yeah. Okay, moment of truth here. Nope. I doesn't see it at all. I uh, doesn't see it at all. Um, we, there is really that... Um, there is a s sequence of... of uh, things to do to make it see it um, yeah it may not just be auto detect all the new hardware yeah um, I wonder yeah that device doesn't show up at no. all um, there I could probably uh, look those up I was just say I mean our other option is to go back and boot the installer again and then just get back we can look in the shell there and see what it sees the device as yeah i'm looking at um so um the That's chz easy. command uh on a website here ah, okay yeah that device name to distinguish the by the yeah. And, oh, there's enable a device. 
Yeah, first there is a way to first scan for devices, um, but uh, okay, list types to display supported device types. Yeah. Offline. Okay, I, I'm actually now on an Ubuntu page and it says to do um, so okay, so So it's ch uh, my controls. So oops. Okay. Uh, yeah. So it's. Studio. Oh yeah. TK uh, Ubuntu. Okay. Configured. Yeah. So. Okay. So they will just still show up as DASD. Yeah, DASD. Okay. Perfect. Um, so it'll be DASD A when it's the only device. And uh, so now, if we look at Dev, we have yep. And also, Great. we should be able to see it from uh, uh, more rock and uh, DA. It's interesting, up here on the change ZDEV command, you told it DASD in the address, and it already knew. You can see it's DASD-FBA under the sys tree. So uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it is able to probe that and, and know what type it is. Uh -huh. Oh, test. Oh, yeah, there's the slash. Uh, there'll be files in there. There they are. Okay, yeah. So we see one is a CKD type, and then one's an FBA type. And, and the, both, I mean, yeah, this is what I was looking for the blocks. So it is the correct. It did recognize it. So as you can see, in the Linux on the mainframe, of course, it needs to deal with the fact that the mainframe is a completely different architecture and so that's why we need the commands like um, the one we saw here oops this one um, this is all mainframe doesn't exist on the Intel architecture uh, at all but um, this is the bus um, so in Linux on the mainframe has a notion of bus device kind of like also deck computers used to uh, have and also uh, for instance, I believe the PA RISC um, computers as well, and and Sun, they have a, a notion of a bus device, and that's what we're uh, providing it with here. Oh, yes, yeah, so that's what all these zeros are. Is in our emulated environment, right? It's just everything is on the same uh, the same bus here. Yeah, and the bus will be a channel in on the underlying Hercules, but Linux sees it as a channel because obviously uh, we can yeah. we could. Um, in here, by the way, in Hercules a configuration file, you could div you can specify a channel address. So a little um, feature that is largely unknown, but you could specify in the Hercules configuration file a different channel for each device if we wanted to, which it can speed up things quite a bit because then each channel has its own thread. So there is there is a way to make things faster as long as the underlying yeah. as as long as the Guest operating system knows about it. Sorry, understands what it's doing there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Because um, again, right in the mainframe world, there isn't really such a thing as attaching the end device directly to the mainframe. Right, it's always going through channel controllers. Yeah. Right? Thirty-three ninety DASD goes through a what is it? Thirty-eight ninety controller. That's the wrong number, but it's it's a thirty-nine um, ninety. Yeah. Thirty-nine ninety, and so. Uh, that's part of what mediates between the actual 
final devices on kind of that star topology, uh, then back to the central processing complex of the mainframe. Yep. All right, so I think let's go over uh, again to our um, in here. No, I think it's in here. Yeah, so back to our precede template. Um, I think we can do Hartman Auto. that writable because oh, it you know, it's copied off the CD so I'm suspecting all of those are probably um, yep uh, so there's a DI Hartman auto disk and that's where we'll tell it that we're doing dev DASB A okay yep and then we can tell it DI Hartman auto method is regular. Yeah, no LVM, yeah. No LVM. And uh, it looks like we can tell it to, let's see, we're starting with a new disk image, so I'm not sure these will be relevant, but this will say if there are existing um, Oh yeah. Partitions or anything, right? It will just automatically overwrite those or remove those. Yeah. So we can do that for LVM, um, MD, which is the Linux RAID. Yeah. And we will also tell it to automatically confirm any changes yeah, to our vision table. These are all under this LVM tag, so I don't know if these will actually apply when we're using the regular method, but I've had these in my template forever and it never asked me anything about disks. So yeah, since these are flags, if it's, if it's not needed, it won't take yeah. it. Yeah. So, so what happens now with the LVM by default lines just below us now? Yeah, so I think we'll probably get rid of those. Yeah. Um, so the other option is, uh, if you remember having gone through Ubuntu and Debian installers, it asks you if you want you know, the simple everything in one partition or if you want separate home partitions, separate var partitions. Um, the all-in-one uh, partitioning scheme, which I think will just be fine for our use, is called the atomic partitioning scheme. Oh, okay. Yep, did not know that. Um, and so that will automatically select that option uh, that you normally get during the installer to say, do you want it all in one? Mm -hmm. uh, so then, yeah, suggest LVM by default. I think we just get rid of yeah. those. And uh, so I think I think there's a like overall uh, automate as much as possible directive, and and so the uh, network configuration at the beginning we ah uh, yeah so that stuff we do we should yeah we should copy over all the relevant yep. network config yeah I don't think order matters here but logically it makes sense that that would be at the yeah the top so let's go. Uh, I can be fancy about this and do it all from within Vim. What would be quicker? I'll just switch between the, the windows here and copy and paste. Um, so sure, I assume we want to, in fact, let me just copy all of this in. And I'll delete anything if we don't want it. So the funny thing about the formats we're using for this uh, video is that uh, people who, the, the very same content that we're doing right now People who view it on your channel will see a completely different uh, uh, terminal and, and different view of all this, probably even different colors than the people who are watching the exact same video on my channel. So I think it's going to be fun to see what comes out at the end. That's interesting. We're recording this separately on both sides, so yeah, uh, we'll see. Uh, we'll see if people like that. 
Okay, so yeah, this is all, these are good questions. We want to keep that. Yep. Uh, this, I'm, I'm going to leave that commented out. I don't think that's. No, we didn't have that question. Relevant. I'm going to move this up in the order it appeared in the installer. Just again, to keep this somewhat logically organized. Luckily, both of us are Vim um, people. <laughs> yeah. It would be hard if one was Emacs, the other with Vim. I don't think we could get along. <laughs> we need fighting over whoever starts up the editor in our shared session wins. Yeah. Uh, again, I don't remember this confirmation question, but I'll leave I, that in there. It can't hurt. Yeah. Okay, protocol, leave that in there. Is that the same? Same question. Yeah. Uh, so we What's missing is the needed... password for the SSH connection. That's a good point. Yeah. Um, let's because... see. Let's see if that's was back in here. I wonder what that would be called. So this is the actual user password setup. Network console. I wonder if it's going to be a network console password. Password. That's it for password. TK Ubuntu. Yeah, I don't think it's there. Um, I don't think it puts it in there. Um, yeah, so how would we find, I'm going, let's switch over to, uh, on my side, I'm switching over to a web browser to <laughs> Google uh, precede remote install password. Let's see if we get lucky here. Setting the root password, uh, make password. Yeah, this a lot of this is just talking about the yeah. uh, Debian installer remote. Okay, uh, net config, network console password and network console password again. So we can do it as a plain text. Okay. Um, Which is fine for our purpose. So yeah, we'll do that for now. Well, and again, this isn't used after the initial exactly. setup. And in fact, right, the user won't ever connect to this at all, I think, because the install will just happen automatically. Yes. But yeah. it may, it may uh, need it to continue. Need it to continue the automation. Yeah. So we'll, we'll put this in here. Let's see, this was... This is the wrong one, I think. Yeah. Yep. Let's see, in fact, am I in what terminal? Yeah, here we go. Yeah, put that up here. So. So password. I'm guessing that's the type, and this is the... Yeah. That. That's the key value. Yep, I think you're right. Yep. Okay, so there's all the disk stuff. Uh, look at what else they give us. So force task server. So this, I assume, is setting up the server persona package selections. Yep. Yeah. Uh, language support false. Only ask the UTC question if there are other operating systems installed. Actually, uh, so wouldn't it be so UTC auto true. Um, Quite, don't yes. be the splash screen. Yes. Don't be quiet. That's good. Front end. That's fine. A few seconds for grub. Well, we don't have grub on the mainframe, but uh, that's okay. Have the network and install OEM config. Network. I wonder if this is steps that it's going to ask us to complete manually, which isn't quite what we want, but we'll yeah. take a look at that. Um, but the problem is we won't know if you're not logged in, so 
I don't know how this works, how we will debug yeah, this. Yeah, and if, I wonder if we log in over that SSH connection, if we'll then see the automated stuff hmm. happening uh, yeah. as well. Um, so I'm going to we're look. We're walking on uncharted territory here. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, okay, so we turned off Splash. That's good. Uh, the other, some of the other things I have in my file are um, Debian installer locale, so it doesn't ask us for that. Oh yeah, yeah. And the keyboard is keyboard configuration XKB key map select US. Yeah. And there's a, uh, you know, the other thing we haven't done is give it the IP address. Yep. And so the gateway. Look, uh, yeah, IP address and gateway. And, and DNS. And DNS, sure enough. Uh, I wonder if those are all just going to be sort of the standard. So that would be 10.1.1.1. Okay, yeah, so there's a standard net config. So there's our IP for gateway. I don't see, we'll have to. I guess we'll have to search for dot two. To yeah, see. we'll need to look for all the other addresses. Let me. Windows just confusing me. Let me get rid of that. <laughs> okay, so 10.1.1. There's two. Whoops. 10.1.1.2. But I don't see the um, the uh, net mask. That's weird. Yeah, certainly if it's just a default class full. Um, C. This mean. is a class A, so it, it's probably a separate actual net mask entry. Okay. So let's copy that and give it uh, give it here. And if we search for two five five two five five, there oh, it is. Oh, there it is. Yeah. So it is class C. Because uh, we had I had typed in slash twenty four during the oh, okay. installation. So I mean, technically, because this is just that point to point within. It's, it's fine. It, yes. Yeah. It's yeah. I mean, yeah. We can use whatever. Um, yeah, we can make the class. We can use as small as a dot two five two. <laughs> yes. Um, as long as we don't have other hosts we're trying to get to in the same ten dot one dot one, yeah, uh, this will this will be fine. We'll just do that for now. And, and I saw something about program. LVM on this other one. What was that? Uh, Partman VG reduce no selection. Oh, again, I'm thinking yeah. these are the yeah the error handling, uh, the bogus entries we don't need. Yeah. Um, the DNS server is not. It may be um, eight dot eight dot eight. Let's see. Oh, because right, this was a different install. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Okay. Okay, at this spot, we will now finish part one. It's been uh, already an hour and a half of intensive work and uh, we will resume uh, in a in the next video with part two where we continue to explore how to make the pre-seed work so that we can fully automate the installation procedure and uh, and then there's going to be a third part where we look at uh, how this all comes together and how we automated it and provide an easy to download and install solution for all viewers out there See you in part two. Thank you very much. And don't forget to subscribe to the Motion's Mainframe channel, as well as to Matthew Wilson's Mainframes and More with Matthew channel. Goodbye.